Gaza is a cage, a prison. No wonder people want to break out of it. Not my words on the mother of all talk shows, but the words of the greatest living Israeli, the last Israeli journalist, Gideon Levy, talking on the BBC earlier today. This is the story of a jailbreak in which particularly ghastly things always occur. We'll be talking to some of the best witnesses to the events and to what they might mean for the region and for the world as the prospects of a Middle East war to be taken in conjunction with the Eastern European war and the war in the Straits of Taiwan that we either have already or may be in the offing. It could scarcely get more serious than this. So you better fasten your seatbelts because it's sure to be a bumpy night here on the mother of all talk shows. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows podcast with George Galloway. Gideon Levy, whom we uh, tried very hard to get on the show this evening, but understandably, he is somewhat busy, although he's been a guest on the mother of all talk shows many a time, surely spoke the most fundamental truth when he said on the BBC earlier today that Gaza is a cage, a prison, and that if people can break out of it, they surely will try to do so. He wasn't the first, actually, to say that. The former British Prime Minister, David Cameron, and I was sitting there in the room with him, described Gaza as the largest open-air prison in the world. And indeed, that was exactly what it was. And it has gotten worse since. In one of the smallest pieces of land ever to accommodate More than 2 million people, 2.2 million people now, although they are dying like flies right at this minute as I speak. 2.2 million people jammed into a territory 21 kilometers long and only a few kilometers wide. It is the most densely populated place on the earth. And It is sealed off from the world and has been so for almost the last decade. It has been 75 years a cage or prison, but for the last 10 years almost, it is literally impossible to go in or come out of the Gaza Strip. And the electricity and water are controlled by the Israeli side and frequently switched off as they are right at this moment in time. No electricity, no water for 2.2 million people. To call that a cage is actually not an exaggeration. It is a calorie controlled goldfish bowl in which the owner of the bowl shoots regularly with devastating effect into the mouth of the bull, killing as many of those inside as they choose to do, knowing that no one in the world will put a stop to it. No one will sanction the killer. No one will seek to deprive them of the means of doing the killing. No one will kick them out of the Eurovision Song Contest or the European Football Contest, knowing that they have absolute impunity from the so-called international community. They have regularly devastated the 2.2 million in the Gaza Strip. They are now determined, and they are saying it in every more, ever more lurid terms, to reduce Gaza to dust and rubble, and to kill a very large number of Palestinians therein. But if that worked, It would have worked already four times in the last 10 years. Four times. Gaza has been reduced to rubble four times. Thousands of Palestinians in Gaza have been massacred. 
but it didn't solve anything. It made every matter worse. And when taken in conjunction with events in Jerusalem, particularly around the Al-Aqsa Mosque, one of the most holy places for Muslims, and indeed just a hundred yards or so away, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, uh, where Jesus' body was laid after the crucifixion, and where Christians are beaten and spat upon by the very Israeli settlers that we are seeing so many crocodile tears shed for this evening are in the neighborhood. I was just watching one the other day of some Asian Christians coming out to carry their cross along the Via Dolorosa. Uh, They were brutally assaulted by a group of Israeli settlers and no one in a uniform, an official uniform, step forward to help them at all. All the more surprising then that some of the most holy Jews in Christendom in the United States, but also in Britain, people who are never done telling us what gallant Christians they are, turn out to be the greatest lovers of Netanyahu's Israel. But I get ahead of myself. Most of you know, I know the Gaza Strip very well indeed. I'm not a supporter of Hamas as it happens. I was there at the birth of Hamas. The midwife was the state of Israel itself, which deliberately, as a matter of deliberate policy, brought Hamas into being to weaken my friend Yasser Arafat and the secular nationalist movement of al Fatah and the PLO. No one can dispute that. The history is very clear, attested to by Israeli politicians and soldiers who were around doing the midwifing. I have never supported Hamas. I didn't support them before they backed uh, the head-chopping, throat-cutting mass murderers of ISIS and Al-Qaeda to try and destroy the regime in Damascus, and I certainly don't support them now. But the Palestinian people are not Hamas. And in fact, the fighting currently underway, by some reports, only 10 kilometers away from linking up the Gaza Strip with the West Bank, are from all of the Palestinian factions. The Palestinian people in Gaza are victims here. They were told by Netanyahu uh, just uh, 24 hours ago that they must leave because Israel was about to level the Gaza Strip. But leave to where? It is precisely the point that they are unable to leave. Nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. Leave to where, Mr. Netanyahu? How? By what means were they expected to leave? He knew that, of course, just as well, if not better, than I know it. It was merely for show, because he knows that already a vast number of Palestinians, by previous comparisons, at least half of them, women and children, are being massacred by high-powered Israeli weaponry diving from the skies. Not hang gliders, not kites, not stones, not Kalashnikovs, or increasingly, it seems, American weapons that have been sold to the Palestinians from Ukraine. I saw pictures today of people in the West Bank celebrating with MR rifles in their hand. They didn't get them from Iran. They didn't get them from Russia or anywhere else. They got them from Ukraine, directly or indirectly. Just think uh, about that. No, the people doing the killing this evening in very substantial numbers are flying the most advanced American warplanes and firing the most advanced American rockets and destroying and killing the lives of thousands, maybe tens of thousands, before it's finished. And the bloodlust may satisfy 
some, heaven knows, have blocked enough people on Twitter in the last 24 hours who are open. Nikki Haley, running for the presidency of the United States, demanded that Netanyahu finish them all. Presumably all 2.2 million of them. Well, it would be a final solution, I suppose. But not really, because the 800,000 Palestinians who were driven out of their homes in 1948 by ethnic cleansing and their land and homes, houses stolen and given to people who already had homes in many cases, in Brooklyn, in New York, in London, in Paris, in Russia. These Palestinians are now some 12, 13, 14 million Palestinians scattered around the world to the four corners of the earth. And you can't, Mrs. Haley, kill all of them. You cannot finish all of them. And everyone who survives this onslaught will grow up to want to break out of the cage again. Isn't that obvious, even to the thickest skulls? If mass murder of Palestinians actually solved the problem, it would have been solved long ago because Israel has been massacring Palestinians since 1948. When they stopped their terrorist attacks on the British, Yes, even Winston Churchill they tried to murder in London when he was fighting Adolf Hitler in the Second World War. They murdered by terrorist attack so many British officials in Palestine and indeed in London. They invented modern terrorism. If you don't know that, then butt out of this argument. If you don't know that, you're not qualified to be in this discussion. The King David Hotel killed 93 British officials in Jerusalem as a result of a terrorist attack on the hotel in which they were living. Israel invented terrorism and has practiced terrorism against the captive Palestinians and those in exile in other countries nearby, ever since that date, I've seen it, smelt it. I've even been under the bombs in Beirut in 1982. It's the fact that some people don't know that, or don't want to know that, have turned their faces away from that that betrays the reality behind the absolute tsunami of fake news on the internet and on the mainstream media over the last 48 hours. And the biggest lie is that what's happening right now was unprovoked. This conflict is the least unprovoked conflict in all history. If I started speaking now about the ways in which it was provoked, this show would be over before I had finished speaking. Palestine has been wiped off the map. Its people scattered to the four winds. Those that remain live under illegal military occupation in the West Bank under annexation illegal annexation in East Jerusalem and under total siege if they have the misfortune to live in what Gideon Levy called a cage. Now, the reality is I warned about this in speeches in Parliament over and over and over again, as did many others from the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, and many others working closely at the face of this conflict. But nobody took any notice. As Gideon Levy says, what did you expect to happen 
If you put something in a pressure cooker and turn up the heat, then what is going to happen but an explosion? And that is what we are witnessing now. There have been many explosions in the past, but none of them with quite the devastating effect that this latest explosion has done. It has demonstrated that the days when Israel could keep people forever locked up in a cage are coming to an end. That the balance of power in their country and indeed in the wider Levant and indeed throughout the Middle East is rapidly changing in line with the rapidly changing balance of power in the world. It started in the defeat in Afghanistan. It continued in the defeat of NATO in the Ukraine. And now it is being demonstrated in the Middle East. Joe Biden's about to move the US Navy close to the coast of Israel. That'll do a lot of good for guys roaming around the Israeli countryside with small arms. What are you going to do with your naval ships? Joe, this is all performative farce. The truth is, if the resistance in Lebanon, Hezbollah, join this war, then Israel will lose it. It cannot fight both Hezbollah and the Palestinian resistance at the same time. Not least because the allies of these two resistance movements would join in immediately from Iraq, from Yemen, and ultimately, of course, in the end, from Iran. The balance of power has changed. And it's about time Western statesmen who give a blank check, unlimited military aid, which they're doubling down on right now as I speak, and all the propaganda has barra at their disposal, who choke off alternative points of view. Do you think anyone from British television has called me today? A man more intimately involved with the Palestine-Israel conflict than any other person in public life today. 50 years of it. Think any of them have called me? They deliberately have fostered a situation where like Pavlov's dogs, people go running after the next thing. First it's COVID, then it's Ukraine, now it's Israel. The lights are going up all over Europe. But the public ain't buying it, as can be seen, despite all the censorship in social media and in the total lack. Have you seen a pro-Israel demonstration anywhere in the world over the last 48 hours? No, you have not, for there has been none. It's about time that the people in Israel and their backers in the so-called international community sat down and implemented the peace agreements that were signed on the White House lawn by Yasser Arafat and Yitzhak Rabin. Now, 30 years ago, and not one inch of the territory referred to in those agreements has been freed from Israeli occupation and siege. And if you don't do it quickly, the fire next time may consume many more and including the rest of us. Because war, wider regional war, may very well become the site of an international conflagration with big powers on both sides. And we could have another Ukraine burning 
in the middle of the Middle East. They say, Blinken said, he wants a two-state solution. I think that's beyond Hercules himself, but let him implement it, if that's what he wants. Let's see it. Not in another 30 years, but 30 years after it was agreed on the White House lawn that day. Personally, I believe that the only future for that territory is one state called Israel-Palestine, where every person and every religion is the equal one of the other, where Christians and Jews and Muslims live as equal citizens under the law, with Jerusalem an international city guaranteed by the powers for freedom of worship and the freedom of that which is sacred to them in the buildings on the Temple Mount. That's what I prefer. Utopian, I hear you say, maybe so. But it's no further away than the two-state solution they all still pretend to believe in. Gaza is a prison break. Ugly, ghastly things happen during prison breaks. But what's happening now in response will bathe the Mediterranean shore in blood and achieve precisely nothing. Stay tuned. You are listening to the Mother of All Talk Shows podcast with George Galloway. Now, the one place nobody is looking to, to bring about a ceasefire, to kickstart any negotiations, to implement any peace plan, is the United Nations. What? Do we still have a United Nations? Ah, well, we're asking on the poll, is the United Nations a busted flush? Yes, or no, 17,225 people have voted already. And I'm afraid it ain't looking good to whoever is the Secretary General of the United Nations these days. Do you know? I certainly don't. Now, my first guest, let me give you the phone numbers first. You're welcome to comment on anything I've said. 0808196552 is the British and Irish number. Completely free of charge, 0808196552. The US and Canada, pardon me, US and Canada number, equally toll free, is plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. That's plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. And the rest of the world, which is most of you, I'll grant, is four four two zero three nine double six two six two five four four. Two zero three nine double six two six two five. My first guest has been a friend of mine for forty years. He is a Palestinian from Gaza, from the refugee camps, and he grew up to be, for a time, the last Arab journalist. Sometimes called the last Arab. Actually, he's been joined by quite a few Arab journalists now and quite a few more Arabs than there used to be. He's Abdel Bari Atwan, and I welcome him back to the mother of all talk shows. Abdel Bari, uh, I know that you will be watching these events even more closely than everyone else. I just wanted your view on whether or not this came as a complete surprise to the Israeli authorities. There are many out there who can't get their heads round the most scrutinized fence in all the world being able to be smashed down and a very substantial number, it seems, of fighters able to break out of what Gideon Levy called the cage. What's your take on that? 
To be honest, uh, George, first, it is lovely to be with you again. Ser seriously, I follow your program all the time. What I want to say, I am all the time on the phone with my family in Gaza. Now, when we are speaking, the Israeli warplanes, American manufactured warplanes, are bombing the refugee camps in Gaza. Until now, more than 800 people were killed by these bombing. And uh, I just so I received a picture of two babies were killed by these uh, Israeli raids against Gaza. And the second thing, you know, I thought is Gaza, honestly, I thought Gaza is a superpower. When the United States sent its aircraft, uh, um, uh, you know, warplanes, F-15, F-16, uh, F-35, when they sent it to Gaza, I never thought that Gaza is a superpower. Why doesn't Biden send this to Ukraine to save the Ukrainian people, you know, and who actually destroyed their country, who actually uh, you know, made it a failed state completely? The Israeli now uh, surprised by this. Why? Because they thought that nobody is daring to fight the Israeli. Nobody is daring actually to go and uh, try to liberate its uh, territories when, under the Israeli occupation. You know, the, 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 the faction there, they had exercise, military exercise, and actually they are trying to say that we are going to liberate our land and they were very clear but the Israeli joked and they said this is nonsense nobody can fight the Israeli it is the arrogancy so they were surprised they were you know their intelligence service which is supposed to be the best in the world completely failed their military power which is supposed to be the fourth power in earth also failed completely so now they are seeing about 700 Israeli were killed and now now, most of the south of Israel or Palestine is now liberated by the faction, military faction from Gaza. George, and you know, you mentioned Gaza. Gaza is 150 square mile only. That's all. So does it need aircraft to, to defeat Gaza? I'm, I'm really surprised, you know, where is the American intelligence? This is supposed to be the biggest superpower in Earth. And send Sending uh, aircraft to Gaza, sending aircraft to uh, you know faction which they only have is guns in order to fight or some bombs here or there. Where is the Israeli army? Where is the Israeli which is not you know uh, being defeated at all? Where are the those you know brains, the Israeli brains who are controlling the country? So what I want to say, it is now unfortunately the West. You mentioned it. You know there is no freedom of speech in this country anymore. Nobody called us and take our point of view. I haven't seen any Palestinian on the television, American television, British television, French television, and they are telling us that they are the civilized, they are the most democratic countries, they have the freedom of, of this expression, they have the values of liberation, of liberalism, sorry, liberalism, and you know, we are backward, we are actually, don't deserve even any, any a program, any program on the, on the media here, and that telling us, you know, you are you are backward you are stupid you are idiot so you, what you deserve is to be killed no you are not allowed to live anymore that's that's the message which they are sending us to us why they didn't interfere when the you know israeli settlers stormed al aqsa mosque when when they actually bombed gaza and killed more than 3000 people of them why we haven't seen these aircraft why we haven't seen the international legality why we don't have seen you know you know, the media, which is supposed to be actually sympathetic with oppressed people. Well, uh, tell your relatives the American fleet is on its way. You'll be able to, they'll be able to look out and see uh, Joe Biden's Navy uh, very soon. There's no doubt at all that the lives and blood of Palestinian children and other Arabs for that matter, I'll come on to that in a minute, uh, is worth less than uh, the lives and the blood of Israelis. That's the only possible explanation for the fact 
that everybody in the West now knows about 700 dead Israelis, but they knew or at least cared nothing about the thousands, tens of thousands of Palestinian dead people over this last period. Uh, the, the children of a lesser God, it would seem. Am I right? Yes, you are absolutely right, George. You know, you are saying, you know, the truth here. Nobody would like to listen to this truth at all. You know, I, when I found my, my family there in Gaza, they told me the bomb just was very close to us. We were about to die. And where is the international community? You know, look, sh shall I summarize it that way? You know, they said to, to us, the Palestinians, they said, look, you know, what's fighting? Why should you fight? You know, come to the international community. Listen to the international community. Apply the international community resolutions of the Security Council and the, the General Assembly. Why? We will. We gave the Israeli state. What, we will give you a state. Okay, we accepted that. And then, you know, said, no, you have to talk to the Israeli. You have to negotiate with them. You have to sit with them. And, you know, you will find a solution that will support you. We went and we signed, or the, the PLO signed uh, Oslo Agreement. And this was 30 years ago, George, 30 years ago. And since then, we are talking to the Israeli, negotiating with the Israeli, uh, no, protecting the Israeli, the, 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 the Palestinian national uh, authority protecting the settlers in the West Bank. And do you know what is our reward? Our reward as a Palestinian from the international community, from the Western civilized world is, you know, 800,000 settlers in the West Bank. 800,000 settlers. And to put Gaza under sanction, people living less than, the family families li living less than Fifty dollars a month, and also the some aid, some uh, you know rice from the United Nations, and they don't have anything else. And this is the civilized world. You know the Israeli used to count the calories which they send it to the Palestinians in order to see them to, to keep them in the edge of life. This is the civilized world. This is those people who are, you know, saying that we are representing the Western values on the Middle East. We are the only democracy in the Middle East. So we, what shall we do? What do you expect the people to do, the Palestinian people to do? What I expect is exactly what has happened. Let me just shift your focus for a minute, because I haven't seen anybody else mention this. Not one week ago, a terrorist attack in Syria on a passing out parade killed almost a hundred people, 35 of them women and children. The blood was everywhere on the parade ground. It was an attack by a drone launched from Idlib in American controlled Syria occupied Syria. It was launched by Al-Qaeda, who are being protected by the United States and the so-called international community. And do you know, I have not seen one single report on that mass terrorist murder in Syria over this last week. So it's not just Palestinians. It's all the Arab blood that is almost worthless for the Western media and the Western politicians. George, you know, it is not only Syria. You remember Iraq. You remember a million people killed by those civilized Americans. They, to bring democracy to Iraq, to make Iraq the best country in the Middle East. Where is the democracy? Where is the, the, the Iraq, which used to be very, very, very luxury country? It's highly educate, educated. They destroyed Iraq. And now they are imposing sanctions on Syria. You know, I've been in Syria recently. The George, people li living less than a 
ten dollar a month, and they cannot actually they don't go to work simply because they cannot pay for the trip. They cannot pay the bus ticket. That's a problem, and the Americans are very happy, and they are supporting those uh, criminal who actually uh, massacre those people on the uh, military uh, academy. So we, uh, the same thing happened in Libya. George, where is Libya? Where is Libya? We saw, you know, there were, you know, uh, uh, earthquake. There were storm in Libya. What happened? You know, there is no actually any any means of saving the people. You know, thousands and thousands of people were killed because of the, this storm. So, yeah, where, where is the democracy in Libya? Where is the state in Libya? Where is the, you know, the, they promised the Libya to be the best in the world. Where is the money of the Libya? More than $200 billion of the, of the Libyan money were stolen. The same thing, who is controlling the oil field, the gas field, the, the uh, wheat field in in, in, in Syria. It, this is the American. It is the American gangster. So this is the America, the, the, you know, the prophet of democracy, prophet of freedom, prophet of, you know, human rights, prophet of luxury, uh, prosperity. That's what is happening. And when we say that, oh, you are, you are, you are a terrorist. No, you are support terrorism. Did I kill a million or two millions in Iraq? Did I kill, you know, every day there are people died in Syria? Did I make, uh, uh, you know, Libya anarchy and a failed state completely? And the people, half of the people now actually uh, fled to neighboring countries, to Syria and to Egypt, while their country is one of the richest in the world, at least a hundred billion dollars a year out of our revenue. This is, this is the uh, Condoleezza Rice uh, vision. This is uh, Hillary Clinton vision. This is the, even Obama vision who won the oil, oil uh, sorry, who won the, uh, the prize, you know. So this is the, this is the problem. Nobel, the Nobel. The yes, and you know, I forgot it because simply it is, it is useless. It is nothing. So, George, what shall I summarize it that way? Now, now imagine the Israeli saying that the, Isra the, the Palestinian uh, treating the Israeli uh, uh, um, war, uh, you know, the, 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 the Israeli citizen who were captured by the faction in Gaza, you know, uh, the calling that they, they are not treating him by a human way. Where, 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 what kind? Tell me about the Israeli human history. Tell me about the, the, the actually the, what they did to Lebanon, what they did to Gaza, what they are doing to uh, other places in Syria, bombing every day or every week. So this is the problem which we, have, which we are witnessing in that part of the world. Abdel Bari Atwan, thanks for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Is the United Nations a busted flush? 18,000 people have voted and it's not looking good for the United Nations. Coming up in just one minute, the one and only Scott Ritter. You don't want to miss it, I promise you. Stay tuned. You are listening to the Mother of All Talk Shows podcast with George Galloway. Scott Ritter, the most popular guest on the Mother of All Talk Shows, bar none, a former weapons inspector for the United Nations, a former intelligence officer with the United States Armed Forces, a man who's forgotten more about war than most of the armchair warriors think that they know. Scott Ritter, welcome back uh, to the mother of all talk shows. I've got so many things I want to ask you, but where is this likely to go now? Unfortunately, George, you're 100% correct. I mean, this is a conflict that cannot end until one side or the other has been decisively beaten and is willing to make the kind of compromises that um, they're not willing to make now. And frankly speaking, given the level of suffering that the Palestinian people have uh, undergone over the, the past seven decades, um, they're not likely be, to be the side that breaks first. Uh, Israel is a 
fundamentally um, broken nation morally. Uh, it's a nation that, um, you know, regardless of what you think, I, I happen, I, I know some people take umbrage at this, but I happen to be somebody who believe that Israel has the right to exist and that, uh, that uh, you know, we should respect Israel's right to exist, but not in the way that it exists today. You can't exist on the backs of people that you've enslaved and they have enslaved the uh Palestinians. In fact, it's worse than slavery because slaves at least get to have the pretense of working in the fields, uh, pretending for a moment maybe they're free. Uh, the Palestinians, especially those in Gaza, are stuck in this open air prison, uh, not of their own construct. Um, you know, Israel underwent a, a fundamental change in its demographics and politics in the 1990s when they opened the, the, the doors to the former Soviet Union and hundreds of thousands of um, Soviet Jews fled to Israel, uh, altering the balance. So when I was in Israel in the 1990s, uh, there was a struggle between uh, right and left, but both agreed that there was a necessity for peace. However imperfect their political solutions might have been, I know for a fact that Yitzhak Rabin was looking for a peaceful outcome, looking for a settlement before he was assassinated by a right-wing Israeli and now Benjamin Netanyahu has stepped into the gap. And ever since then, Israel has been drifting towards an even more radical right wing solution. As long as Benjamin Netanyahu and his ilk are in power in Israel, there is no hope for peace, none whatsoever. And you are right. Israel will go into Gaza with a vengeance and hundreds, if not thousands of Palestinians will lose their lives. And in the end, some morally conscious uh, nation, uh, and I say that with the, the greatest um, uh, I don't believe it. There's no such thing as a morally conscious nation that keeps their tongue silent now. But some nation, the United States, perhaps, will say enough is enough. Uh, even we can't stomach the slaughter that you have perpetrated. And it's time to bring this fighting to a halt. And the cycle will begin all over again until the next time. Now, the only hope, only hope for this outcome not to go that way is if Hezbollah gets involved in a major way. And breaks the paradigm. And if Hezbollah is backed by Syria and Syria is backed by Iran, and then we will see the strategic defeat of Israel. We may see the end of Benjamin Netanyahu physically or politically. Um, and whatever replaces him in Israel will be somebody who is compelled by this defeat to seek peace in a way that's equitable for the Palestinian people. But until which time Israel is strategically defeated, there's no hope for peace. None whatsoever, because Israel, as it currently exists, can't have peace because peace requires them to treat the Palestinian people with respect, with dignity. And Israel today is incapable of treating the Palestinian people with the respect and dignity, not only that they deserve, but that they demand. What happened yesterday, as violent and ugly as it was, was a manifestation of the demand that the Palestinians be treated seriously with respect. I, like everybody else, I think shudders at the death and destruction that took place. I wish it had never happened. But you sow the wind, you reap the whirlwind, and Israel is reaping the whirlwind right now as we speak. It's tragic, but tragically it's necessary. What do you say, Scott, to those who uh, doubt the scale of the negligence that appears to have been uh, involved in all of this being planned, it clearly was planned. Uh, the build up to it must have been long in the making. Uh, and yet this most heavily surveyed uh, patch of earth uh, in the world, uh, all this was taking shape and then executed with quite spectacular levels of military success, however ghastly. Look, there's no doubt that Hamas has pulled off, and this will be studied for years. Again, military professionals have to put aside politics and study military events with a professional eye. And what Hamas did yesterday is one of the most remarkable military feats in modern history. First of all, to be able to plan this without being detected by the Israelis is, as you indicate, almost miraculous. Now, I have a uh, an, an answer as to how this came about. I actually have just written an article. It'll come out in Consortium News uh, later this afternoon uh, that addresses this issue. But the um, 
I think this, you know, Winston Churchill once famously said that uh, he quipped about the uh, war office that they are always fighting the last war, never the next war. Israel is guilty of that in my mind. Um, they are fighting 2021 Operation, um, I forget whatever, they, they named so many things, uh, uh, Wall Guardian or Guardian of well, Walls or something so like that. But um, Israel openly bragged at the end of this conflict, which they claim to have won, and yet Hamas still exists. Um, they said this was the first artificial intelligence war. That it, You mentioned it. It's the most heavily surveilled piece of terrain in the world. Every 10 minutes, every meter of Gaza is photographed by Israel. And that data, those images go into a giant computer database. They collect every cell phone conversation, every text message, any email messaging. They have total control. They have human spies on the ground. And Israel bragged about this right afterwards in 2022. The first artificial intelligence uh, battle, we had total domination of the information spectrum. And we were able to use artificial intelligence to predict outcomes, meaning that it wasn't a human being now that is telling Israel what to do. It is a computer algorithm put together by Israeli intelligence, and the Israelis bragged about this. And I will say this about Hamas, and about the Palestinians, and about Hezbollah. They aren't stupid. These are some of the smartest people on the planet, and they are survivors. And as soon as they heard that Israel had turned over the thinking process to a computer I believe they sat there and they gamed the system and they sat there and they created a whole bunch of artificial information that lulled the computer into a false sense of complacency. And because the Israelis had yielded their thinking ability to a computer, they went into Yom Kippur mode. And I don't mean this year. I mean, 1973, where once again, they had, all the information was there that an attack was going to take place. Hamas said an attack was going to take place. This is not a secret. Hamas has been saying over and over and over again, this is coming. We are going to do this. We will avenge the Al-Aqsa Mosque. So any thinking person, any rational person would have said, we need to prepare for this. Because Israel yielded its thought process to a computer programmed by people who did not respect Hamas. This intelligence failure took place. That's what I firmly believe. Now, uh, the whole of the south of uh, Israel was, uh, for a time, uh, out with the control of the government in Tel Aviv, Jerusalem. Uh, the, uh, the Palestinian militants, the factions, Hamas, Islamic Jihad, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, many, many groups, some of which I actually hadn't heard of before, they were all running uh, amok. They were attacking settlements and settlers. They were defeating uh, Israeli forces that they found. They were capturing Israeli police stations, military bases, prisons uh, even. Uh, why did it take Israel so long to get on top of the situation, even given the caveats that you've just made about how they missed it? coming in the first place? Well, I, uh, there's a couple of reasons. I, I mean, first of all, we'll never know until the Israelis do, and honest to goodness, um, you know, form a commission to uh, do a, a, a politically neutral um, autopsy on what happened here. Um, but I can speculate, uh, you know, and I, I just want everybody to understand that that's exactly what's happening right now is speculation. Um, Israel has been a fundamentally broken state in terms of domestic politics for some time now, ever since Bibi Netanyahu returned as prime minister, his corruption followed him. Uh, his attempt to shield himself from prosecution by taking over the court system so that he and he alone can appoint judges that are favorable uh, to his position has divided this nation, the nation of Israel, like never before. Prior to the Hamas attack, you know, there were hundreds of thousands of Israelis taking to the streets on a regular basis to protest Benjamin Netanyahu. Thousands of Israeli reservists, the very reservists who are being called up now, said they will not serve uh, an Israel that has a Bibi Netanyahu who violates uh, the, the basic fundamentals of law uh, there. So Israel was a divided nation. Uh, the military also, I believe, has just taken a, a unique stance regarding modern warfare. Look, there are many Russians right now who 
have learned the hard lessons of war over, over the course of the past 600 plus days in Ukraine who are looking at the imagery of the Israeli military response saying these are the most amateurish people we have ever seen in our lives. Their tactics, their approach, the, tim- the, 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 the timid nature of these soldiers um, is, is shocking. I think the Israeli army has lost the ability to close with and destroy the enemy through firepower and maneuver. They are so casualty averse that they have they've created a whole unit based upon unique technologies to let robots do the fighting for them. They let computers do the thinking for them. The last thing they want to do is put one of their soldiers on the ground against somebody who is trained and capable of killing them. Very good at beating up women, beating up children, beating up villagers, beating up old men, old women. But they're not very good at fighting people who stand up and fight back. And let's be clear here. The Hamas people who are fighting right now, these are lightly armed people with what their courage is, is cannot be doubted, but their skill set is limited. These are people who do not have not had the advantages of the military training and technology that the Israelis had, and yet they're fighting them still today, as we speak, outside of the Gaza Strip in Israeli territory, they hold 30% of the territory that they captured on day one, and they are fighting. The Israelis can't beat them yet. They will beat them. There's no doubt about that. But Israel has forgotten how to fight. They have forgot. Because Yom Kippur, 1973, was so bloody for them. Their experience in Lebanon was so bloody for them that they said, never again, we won't do that kind of fighting. Unfortunately, when you raise uh, the level of hatred in a captive population, such as the Palestinians in Gaza, and those people decide to rise up, you are going to have to fight. There's a lot of incompetence going on in Israel right now. There's a tremendous amount of military incompetence. I, the people I feel sorry for, to be honest, I mean, I'm just being frank here, are the Israelis who lived in the South. Not because of, you know, the, the, uh, you know there's, a, there's a political question of should they be there, et cetera, et cetera. But these are people who believe the Israeli government when the Israeli government said, we, are, we will keep you safe. You can go to sleep at night. You will be safe. We will be there for you. If anything happens to you, we will come for you. And they were abandoned, abandoned by their government, abandoned by their military. They're still abandoned to this day. Shame on the Israeli government. Shame on the Israeli military. There should be mass resignations, but this is all done because the men and women who wear the uniform today, who didn't come to the rescue of these Israelis in their time of need, should be evicted from their their positions. The, if Israel does invade on the ground, uh, and given that there are now a very substantial number, more than there have ever been before, uh, of Israeli prisoners taken in this uh, Al-Aqsa operation, Al-Aqsa flood, uh, there are real problems about a ground invasion that imperils the, we now know, many Americans are amongst those who have been taken prisoner. Uh, These uh, prisoners, hostages, uh, will be held uh, in exchange, hoping to exchange them for the 5,000 plus political prisoners in Israeli jails. So a ground invasion is fraught with that difficulty of harming their own people, but also the risk of bringing Hezbollah into the conflict and thus the possibility of a very big war, two-sided war, uh, indeed. Uh, So do you think they are going to go in? And if so, how will that work out? Israel conducted a major military exercise earlier this year that tested this very scenario. What would happen if an uprising in the West Bank, uprising in Gaza, Hezbollah intervenes in the north, Iran intervenes. What would Israel do? And they did this major exercise, and it turned out that Israel lost. Israel can't win that war. So Bibi Netanyahu knows this. He was the prime minister when this exercise was was held. His senior military officers know this. And so I have to believe that they're not suicidal. And now the question they are probably asking themselves is, is Hezbollah bluffing? Will Hezbollah really commit to this fight? Um, or is this just a bluff and should we call Hezbollah's bluff? Because there's a tremendous amount of political pressure on Benjamin Netanyahu now to be seen as doing something, something decisive, 
to bring this Hamas uh, issue to an end. And that requires a major military move into Gaza, which I will tell you right now, Israel will lose. Will lose. Because the Israeli army can't suffer casualties. Going into urban warfare, if you've learned anything from you know, Mariupol, if you've learned anything from Bakhmut, these horrible names that have come out, and I say horrible because of the death and destruction that took place in the, the fighting for these places, um, Gaza will become like that and worse. Um, the Israelis will suffer losses like they can't even imagine, greater than the Yom Kippur War in its totality. And this is politically unacceptable for Benjamin Netanyahu uh, and the Israeli people. Um, so I, I, I can't tell you what, what they're going to do. What I can say is that if they go into Gaza, they will have to stop their operation almost immediately because every force there in Gaza will be needed in northern Israel. Because when Hezbollah comes in, they will make what Hamas did the other day look like child's play. The entire north will fall. Haifa could be put at risk. Hezbollah will come in in a very serious fashion. Uh, their missiles, their rockets are not these bottle rockets launched by the, uh, the Hamas. And I'm not, I'm being a little facetious here, but those are children's toys compared to the modern precision guided missiles that Hezbollah has. Tel Aviv will be destroyed. The, the Kiryah, the, where the in, the in the center of Tel Aviv, where the military headquarters is, will be flattened. The prime minister's residence will be flattened. Israel will be flattened. Its airfields flattened. That's the future of Israel, and there's nothing they can do to stop it. The Iron Dome doesn't work. Their missile defense systems do not work. And then when Hezbollah attacks and shows victory, you think Syria is going to remain silent about the Golan Heights. No, Syria will move on the Golan Heights. They have two divisions they brought up to combat readiness as we speak. And if Syria gets engaged, will Iran stand on the sideline? Iran understanding now with Hamas, Hezbollah, and Syria decisively engaged, now is the time to end the Israeli threat once and for all. And Iran will become involved. And now we've seen the strategic defeat of Israel. All, all of this, Scott, is uh, um, a symptom, if that's the right word, uh, of the huge changes that are going on in the world, uh, aren't they? Uh, that uh, Iran was once... Uh, uh, a kind of beaten and isolated uh, power is now no longer isolated and militarily extremely strong with probably the world's greatest drone industry. Uh, the uh, axis of resistance, they call themselves, of Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Hezbollah in Lebanon is a very, very potent crescent indeed. And it's allied with the new great, great powers, Russia and China, who would not allow uh, any of these places to be destroyed by uh, an American-Israeli uh, coalition. So this is all happening because everybody's emboldened uh, by, by the new world political situation, aren't they? There was a day and age where America could put 750,000 to a million troops in the Middle East in a matter of weeks and change the outcome of any conflict. That day is long past. Today we have a military that's a shadow of its former self, incapable of meaningfully projecting power into areas of the world that have been hardened against that very possibility. Iran's ability to sink American ships at a distance has changed the algorithms that are used there. Um, and Iran knows this. America knows this. The, you're 100% correct. They, they've become emboldened, but not, not emboldened based upon irresponsible calculations, emboldened to be the nations they have every right to be. Iran has every right to be a major player in the region because it is a major player in the region, and it will no longer allow the United States and Israel working together with the Gulf Arab states to keep it down. In fact, thanks to China, they've repaired relations with the Saudis and the uh, you know, they, they're, they're moving in the right direction there. Um, the United States today is, is confronting its impotence in Europe and in Asia. Right now, I can guarantee you in the Situation Room at the White House, the Pentagon is saying, boss, we can't do it. We can't do it anymore. Uh, we're already broke. If you if this thing blows up in the Middle East, it's game, set, match. We're done as an economy. Because if Iran does get pulled in and then we respond, there goes 
all the oil production capability in the Middle East. And that's the end of the modern era of humanity, because without that oil, the economy of the world will come screeching to a halt. Um, they know this. And so I think the United States right now is telling Israel, you're going to have a couple days to feel good. Bomb as many buildings, because we never cared about the Palestinian people. George, you know that. Bomb as many buildings as you can. Kill as many people as you want. But then it's over because we can't allow it to escalate further. And that could be the end of Bibi Netanyahu because he will be exposed as the fraud, as the liar, as the insecure old man that he is. And hopefully the Israelis will replace him with somebody who will say never again, but not never again the standpoint that Israel is going to become so strong and mighty that they will forever turn violence through fear. Never again, meaning it's time to seek a meaningful peace with the Palestinian people, because that's the only way we emerge from this without more war a meaningful peace that respects the dignity and the sovereignty of the Palestinian people. Scott Ritter, as always, great to hear from you and to talk with you. Scott Ritter, a man who knows war and politics in equal measure. The one and only Garland Nixon is up next. Garland, thanks for joining us. I'm sure, sorry, it's a slightly truncated uh, interview this evening because of the sheer uh, pace and scale of events. But before turning to what's happening to Donald Trump and Joe Biden, can I just get your take on whether you think American public opinion is as one-sided as the entire political spectrum in the United States government and opposition, including Robert F. Kennedy? It's, it's um, monolithic for Israel in America, or is it down on the street? Um, absolutely not. Now, this is another um, example of the um, the United States government having, you know, completely disassociated itself with U.S. public opinion. The, uh, the public opinion of the U.S. has been drifting away from the um, supporting unconditional support for the U.S. government for the uh, Israeli government for years. However, the extreme nature of the, you know, uh, Smotrich, uh, Ben Gavir, and Netanyahu government has pushed. Many uh, well-meaning Americans and many, you know, honest Americans who really want to understand the conflict away from the government, away from the Israeli government. Even a lot of people that don't understand the history look at the extreme and violent nature of the current leaders of that government, and they are aghast at what they see. So there will be a problem in the um, in in the in this election year as a result of this particular uh, conflict, uh, you know, uh, expanding because the the parties will certainly take the position that uh, Israel is right and that the Palestinians should, you know, face some kind of a violent retribution. And that I don't think that will be very popular amongst the American electorate, particularly amongst youth, youth uh, and, and very much in the Democratic Party. I think the numbers will probably be above 50 percent when it comes to the people who don't support um, a violent uh, retribution by the Israeli government. Um, some of the political leaders are really quite unhinged. I mean, I watched Nikki Haley appear to call for the genocide. Finish them all, she said. She appeared, her eyes were swiveling, totally unhinged. And she's running for president. What is it? Some of the, Anya Parampil, a good friend of both of us, said online just an hour or two ago. Isn't it amazing how the worst people in America are so in love with Israel? It's true. Well, and, you know, in the um, Republican uh, presidential primary, various uh, politicians have staked out a particular position. She staked out the Lindsey Graham, uh, John McCain position to be the most hawkish of hawks. So what you can expect from her is the most over the top, outlandish, violent uh, position on everything, whether it's Ukraine or um, or or the Middle East, Iran, et cetera. She's going to be 
she's taken the position of the John Bolton of the Republican primary, and I think she thinks that's going to benefit her. I can guarantee you that it will get her a lot of money, but it's not going to get her the numbers, as even amongst the populist right, there's uh, less and less, t uh, um, um, you know, appetite for, for violence and war. Speaking of the populist right, their leader uh, for the moment is Donald Trump, though he wavered uh, over whether to go for the speakership of the House. I think that's history now. Uh, but showed his ebullience, his enthusiasm, his determination. But is that all a front? When, with all these legal suits against him, seeking to literally dismantle his business, take his houses, even the ones he's living in, is it, can he realistically get to the starting line in November uh, in good enough shape to run? Um, well, you know, if Donald Trump, the person, can take the amount of pressure that they're putting on him, and I suspect that he can because Donald T Trump is a person who tends to to like a fight, who tends to be a fighter and push back, um, I would think that the in the long term that the results of uh, the deep state um, assault, uh, a lawfare assault on Don Donald Trump will, you know, paradoxically benefit him at the, uh, uh, at the polling booth, that as things become, begin to um, unravel much further than they have now, and that's the direction that we're going, it's clear that the Ukraine conflict is in is is in collapse. And certainly, we've got the um, the issues here in the Middle East. That as those things um, get more and more troublesome for the American people, that they will look for an outsider. Donald Trump is running as the anti-politician, as the outsider. Now, this is even a tough situation for him. In um, in the Middle East, because he took the position during his administration as an arch Zionist, as he tried to, you know, out Zionist uh, uh, Donald, uh, excuse me, Joe Biden. And his comments recently, um, he had a speech, I believe, in Iowa, Idaho, wherever he had a speech. And he simply said, well, if I were president, this wouldn't have happened because I'm strong and Biden's weak. So he really didn't take a philosophical, political or moral position on the conflict in Israel. He simply took an individual Con a position saying basically I'm the right wing strong man and if that were you know if I were in power all the bad guys out there in the world would um, would would run from me and they wouldn't take actions against uh, you know Israel or anyone else so he oversimplified it I don't know how long he can continue with an oversimplification of such of a new such a, a nuanced and um, historical uh, problem, but I think it'll work for him for a while. In that people are focusing on, you know, the the, the bond market, a potential um, economic crash. There's a lot of problems here in the United States that I think Donald Trump will probably be able to navigate his way through. Well, uh, you better hope that there's no major developments uh, in the South China Sea, uh, because uh, a war in Eastern Europe, a war in the Middle East, and dramatic developments in the Straits of Taiwan would, would test uh, all of them uh, very considerably. But he's going to use this. He's already doing it. He's saying that, that America gave $6 billion to Iran, false, of course. This was Iran's $6 billion that was frozen in South Korea and was merely unfrozen. Secondly, it went to Qatar and is to be uh, distributed uh, on very specific goods. But Donald Trump never let the truth get in the way uh, of, a, of a good story. So that's his number one point that Joe Biden gave $6 billion to Iran, and Iran gave it to Hamas, uh, and that Hamas are using it to kill Israeli settlers and soldiers. Secondly, the point you've just made, his line is that uh, nobody respects America because Joe Biden is a shuffling old fool. And I'm afraid Biden's kind of proving that point almost on a daily basis now. 
Oh, absolutely. And well, things have gotten to a point where if you just talk to people on the street, people who are not even, say, you know, um, politically, uh, you know, concerned. To, I, I, and I use this word and I don't mean it in a pejorative way, politically sophisticated people who don't read politics and don't engage in researching politics, day to day people. Uh, it's pretty well acknowledged that Joe Biden it has some um, mental acuity deficiency, shall we say. Everyone knows it. It's the emperor has no clothes. It's not. It's just that the, the mainstream media can't discuss it, even so much so that Joe Biden supporters kind of acknowledge it, but they'll say, but even that, he's still better than Trump because Trump, Donald Trump is, is, is so bad. This is a difficult position for, for Donald Trump I, I also, I think, because Donald Trump's strength, keep in mind, his core support is going to support him come hell or high water. So he doesn't have to say things about Iran or Israel or anything to keep them. He has them. Where Donald Trump's strength is, is in the people who are tired of the system and the people that are angry, people who are, say, independents and to some level, some Democrats, maybe libertarians. And uh, his, uh, you know, talk of uh, Iran as the bad guys are pushing back against Iran or making statements that would make it appear as though he can be somewhat hawkish are actually not in his best interest. Donald Trump, Trump is at his strongest and he makes the most, um, you know, he, he, he pulls in the most energy when he takes either anti-war positions, anti-conflict, if not anti-war, at least anti-conflict. I don't want more conflict. I want a deal. So it doesn't benefit Donald Trump to say Iran's bad guys and we shouldn't do this or that with Iran. His strength is saying, I don't want a war with Iran. I don't want a war with anyone. So it even makes it Donald, uh, tough for Donald Trump uh, to take a position in this conflict. Uh, Joe Biden hasn't forgotten Ukraine, even if the media has for the moment. He's going to bring forward what they're calling a one and done deal for Ukraine, a hundred billion dollars on top of the hundred and ninety billion dollars they've already spent on the principle that this one hundred billion will take us past the presidential election. Can that be serious? And would it go through? Today's Congress? Well, next week we're looking at the likelihood of a Speaker of the House vote. Um, the two people who are running would be Steve Scalise of Louisiana, who was one of McCarthy's closest, closest lieutenants. And I would expect that if Steve Scalise is, Scalise is in charge, then there's a good chance that it'll get thro through. It's going to be tough. Well, there's a chance. I don't know. I'm not even going to say a good chance. Jim Jordan is the other um, person who is uh, vying for the speakership. He is more uh, supported by Trump. He's more supported by the um, by the populist wing of the Republican Party. So uh, I would imagine it would be tougher. There will be tremendous pressure on them. I would think that if they get this through, particularly at this time, when support for this conflict and the neocon project is waning in the EU just before winter, when there's a potential for very significant energy problems at a time when the clearly the uh, Ukrainian um, uh, 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 Offensive has has flopped and the numbers Offensive. are gas over. Yeah. 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 So it's a very difficult time if they would get this through. It could be really bad because they get this number, the, the, this, this through, they get this money through, and then this thing collapses or spirals downhill out of control as it is likely to do. When I mean out of control, I mean out of control for the um, for the Zelensky regime. Um, this getting, you know, be careful what you pray for. You might just get it. If they get this hundred billion billion and then things collapse, then Joe Biden's going to suffer as a result of that. And there'll be heavy pushback. They may be better if this thing is close to collapse, not to do that. So it's going to be it's going to be tough. I don't really think it gets through. Not a hundred billion dollars. I think they cut it down. They'll they'll they they should get something through. But um, the Ukraine conflict is is on its last leg. Uh, I was just going to thank you, but I'm glad you made that last point. The Ukrainian uh, cause is on its last legs, just like the Biden administration. Thank you for joining us, as always, the one and only Garland Nixon. Last few YouTube comments. Dante Alighieri says the UN should impose corridors as soon as possible. At least let the children leave. Gaza is a densely populated, two and a half mile wide strip of land 
with 800,000 children. Who do you think is being killed in these airstrikes? Well said, Dante. But I fear it will not be the United Nations that prevails on that. Michael Enright says there's no way Hamas could carry out that operation yesterday without the IDF, Israel Defense Force, knowing about it. It was a pawn sacrifice move for ulterior motives. Classic Netanyahu. Well, that's a point of view, Michael. I don't share it myself. I think the uh, strategic damage that has been done to Netanyahu and to the idea of Israeli supremacy uh, an ethno-religious supremacy in the land, in the region, in the world, has been dealt a terrible blow. And Ida Makled says, I was terrorized by the Israelis in the 1970s by their air raids. I was about nine years old. I'll never forget. Look, the last call is the one and only Kenny in Acton on Palestine. Go ahead, Kenny. Hi, George. I'd just like to Hi. say to people that I think it's really important to separate the support for what Hamas done and is doing now and the support for the Palestinian cause. You don't have to support the murder of hundreds of innocent men, women and children. I've seen a video on Twitter today. An Israeli woman who had been had her legs broken, she was dead, and she was being paraded through the streets on the back of this SUV surrounded by Hamas terrorists. God knows what happened here, but I want people to start separating their support for the Palestinian cause and what these brutal animal terrorists, in my opinion, and many other people's opinion, are doing, because that's never the answer. Killing innocent civilians is are you not a big the answer. Uh, you struggle for yeah, freedom. Okay. Uh, are, you, are you a big supporter of the Palestinian cause, Kenny? Have you been doing much over your life on that? No, personally, George, no. And I think you already know that. Okay. And that, yeah. uh, well, I do already know it. Of course. I do already know it. That's how I was able to uh, ascertain that you're just a hypocrite. That you don't give a damn and never have given a damn about Palestinian women with their legs broken, about Palestinian children with their heads blown off, about Palestinian children massacred in large, large numbers, tens, scores of thousands, over all the years that I've been fighting for them, and I knew that you didn't give a damn about them, that you only care about Israeli casualties. And that's what condemns you as a hypocrite. And that's why no one can take you seriously. You'd have been better on, better off coming on and singing an Elvis song because you are a bankrupt hypocrite. Unless you have condemned every crime committed against Palestinian women, don't come on here on my show with your crocodile tears for the victims of the last couple of days. And that, dear viewer, is my last word on the show this evening. That unless you believe that the blood of all people is of equal value, that the death of all people is of equal value, that the humanity of all people is of equal value, unless you believe that we are all children of the same God, the one God, the God that the prophet Abraham taught all of us about. Unless you believe that, then you're just a hypocrite. And by God, Kenny, you've shown yourself to be one tonight, but here's the good news. You're not alone. There's a lot of you. You deserve each other. I've been George Galloway. This has been the mother of all talk shows, and God willing, I'll be back on Wednesday at the slightly later time 
of nine o'clock. If you've enjoyed the show and it's been a record audience, then bring someone along because I'm sure this story and others will still be featuring big on the mother of all talk shows. Good night.